So good evening. Thank you all for joining us. I'm Tom Eddington, CEO and co-founder of an organization called Future Shapers. Our uh, work in the world is to bring more conscious leadership into, uh, into humanity, into organizations. We do that through a variety of ways. One is through um, bringing groups of a dozen peers together within or outside of organizations, as long as the individuals view themselves as peers. Over the course of 12 months, they meet once a month for four hours to support and help each other in their growth and becoming a more personal, a more professional, conscious leader. Um, there are a number of my colleagues here this evening who are available to talk afterwards if you're interested in learning more about being a member of a roundtable or learning about our work. In addition to roundtables, we also have a three-day workshop on conscious leadership. We have events like this evening, both here at, uh, at the Battery, as well as um, at uh, the Gladstone Institutes over in Mission Bay. And those are monthly, it's called Meet the Visionary Series. And we bring in people such as our guest tonight, John Perkins, to talk about conscious leadership, to talk about the state of the world and what we all could or should be doing as leaders to have the kind of world that we wanna have. So with that, I'll, Turn it over to John uh, Renish, my co-founder, with uh, me and Future Shapers to introduce our guest. Um, yeah, it's my absolute pleasure to be here. This is our second event here at the Battery. We're here in December with Lynn Twist, who also knows John and is a friend of John's. Co-founders of Panchamama Alliance, yeah. Um, before I introduce John, I want to say a couple of things. Um, we have next, uh, the next event we have here is with uh, Marilyn Schlitz, who is the former scientific director of Institute of Noetic Sciences. And she also served some time as the president of the Institute a couple of years ago. And then three months after that, I think in September, John Perry Barlow, who I understand has been here on a, as a panelist, and he'll be my guest uh, in September. Um, Okay, how do I know you? How do, you, how do I know this guy to my right? Uh, initially, I'm gonna tell a story so before I introduce you. So, um, When I was writing my last book, which is called The Great Growing Up, plug for my book, um, I was talking, I was writing a chapter about dreams and the power of dreams. And in my research, I came across a foundation in Florida called Dream Changers Foundation and called them up and I ended up getting the founder, which is John Perkins, and ended up having a pretty nice conversation with him. Asked him if he was ever in San Francisco. And he said, yeah, I'll be there in like three or four weeks after that. And I said, what part of town are you staying in? And he said, the address, and I, I recognized the address as Bill and Lynn Twist's home. So I said, oh, I know you're staying with the Twist. And we got together while he was here and walked the golf course out there and got better acquainted, but he was also here for the Barrett Kohler. The Barrett Kohler people are here too selling books, uh, who are having an event and then announcing the, the, this is I guess 12 years ago, The Confessions of an Economic Hitman, the first edition. So since then, I've come to know John pretty well. I've become a big supporter of Panchamama Alliance, which is the organization that he and uh, Bill and Lynn Twist started. And he's also one of our consciousness coaches for Future Shapers. He, he came to me a couple of years ago, said he wanted to be coaching executives where he could have more leverage on making change happen. And that conversation grew into putting a team together of 10 people, five men and five women who are all fairly long in the tooth like us and uh, do consciousness coaching, one-on-one -on -one consciousness coaching. So with that, I'll get into my introduction of John. Uh, as you might imagine, how many people here, by the way, have read either the original edition or the current edition of, of the Confessions book? Oh, wow, great. Okay. Anyway, John's, the, the Confessions of an Economic Hitman is a real chilling story of the things that go on that we're not aware, most of us are not aware of. And that is the reality in which we live. That is the reality in which the world is operating, and most of us are unaware of it. But that was his life up until 
he started a Dream Change Foundation and started wor working with indigenous people down in the Ecuadorian rainforest, etc. So we're not going to talk a whole lot, at least I'm not planning to talk a whole lot, about what his life was back then. Uh, that's mostly in the book, because the new book has, I, I just refinished the book about a month ago, this new, the new book. And I read the first one 12 years ago. And to me, I just, I was not saying, oh, I read this before and skipping. It was a brand new book as far as I was concerned. So I think you did an excellent job in creating a brand new book, even though it was a, another edition. And there, I know there's 15 new chapters and all that. But I'd like to focus now on the reality we were looking to create, not necessarily the reality that we have. And there's an old thing that my friend Peter Senge popularized years ago about creative tension. And they use a rubber band to demonstrate, you want to hold that for me? Re demonstrate this is the current reality, the lower hand. And the upper hand is the vision you're holding for how you like the world to be, or the project to be, or your family to be, or whatever. But it's creative tension for any kind of project. And what most people do is they can't stand the tension. So they either lower their vision, or they distort the current reality. Things aren't the way, they aren't exactly the way I thought they were. They're, they're better than they were, I'm closer. So that relieves the tension, which makes them more comfortable. So what, what Peter said to me one time during a lunch in, in Boston is that it, he defines personal mastery as ability to hold that tension. But to hold the vision for what you see as possible, you must tell the truth about what's the reality down here. You can't distort that. And the Confessions book, to me, is a pretty good example of how things really are, even though we're not aware of them ourselves as individual lay people or, or citizens. There are things going on in the reality, even though we see some of the stuff on the media and we see some of the stuff is reported in books, there's lots of this going on. We're, we are in a season of dysfunction. <laughs> I think every, every system that we've created in the world is in some stage of collapse at this point. So we have to tell the truth about what is in order to move on to create the reality, to create the vision that we want to have. So thank you very much for holding the microphone. So with that, um, I'm going to come up with a couple of questions to ask John. I don't even know what they're going to be yet. Um, I remember in the first book, I don't remember it so much in the second book, that moment when you were in the clothes, in the job of economic hitman, and you were on an island someplace by yourself, as I recall, and there was, I think, a wall somehow involved, and you had this flash of, I can't keep doing this. Would you be willing to talk about that moment and how that was for you? Yeah, sure. So. I was an economic hitman. I was chief economist at a consulting firm was my official title, but sort of tongue in cheek, we called ourselves economic hitmen because that's really what we were for 10 years. And when I first got started, I thought that what we were doing was absolutely the right thing. What I was doing was convincing leaders of countries to accept huge loans from the World Bank or one of its sisters, but the money never actually went to the country it went to our own corporations to build infrastructure projects in the country, uh, power plants, industrial parks, things that benefited a few wealthy people, as well as our corporations that made huge profits, but made the rest of the population suffer because money was diverted from health, education, other social services to try to pay the interest on the debt, and it never did pay the principal. So we'd go back at some point and say, since you can't pay your debt, sell your resource, oil, whatever, cheap to our corporations, privatize, sell everything to our corporations, sell your schools, sell your electric utilities, your water and sewage system, your banks, your prisons, your everything to our corporations. And, but at the beginning, all the economic models that I'd studied in business school at the World Bank produced showed that, in fact, this was effective, that if you invested in this infrastructure, the economy of a country went up. And it did. Statistically, it does. What the statistics didn't show is that that just reflected the very wealthy, because the whole economic statistics are skewed to the wealthy, as they are in our country today, as they are in the world. You know, we just 
discovered that 62 individuals have as much wealth as half the world's population. A year ago, it was 85. It's dropped to 62. Is that progress? <laughs> um, so those 62 people skew the whole world economic statistics tremendously. So as I'm going, I go into this job, I think I'm doing what the right thing to do to help these countries. But over a very short period of time, I discovered it wasn't. And then I was kind of trapped in the system because I grew up the son of a pretty poor prep school teacher in New Hampshire. My dad taught at a boys boarding school. He never made any money, basically. We had a house, it was the school's house, food. I ate in a dining room with 200 boys. By the time I was about four, everything was taken care of, but never had any money. And yet I was surrounded by fabulously wealthy young men. I uh, went to school with them, heard stories about the wonders of Paris and Buenos Aires and Rio de Janeiro. And so now I'm living that life. I'm flying first class around the world. I'm getting a pretty good salary. I'm eating at the best restaurants. I'm doing all the things I dreamed about. So I was trapped. Once I discovered that the system wasn't what I thought it was, that the World Bank was lying, that they weren't trying to rid the world of poverty. They were creating a corporate empire. Um, I was really pretty trapped. It was hard to get out. Uh, I thought I was happy because I was living the life that everybody told me was the life I should lead, but I was also taking a lot of Valium, drinking a lot of alcohol as I traveled around the world. And so then, 10 years into this, as my conscience is building up, I took a vacation and rented a small sailboat in the Virgin Islands, sailed to St. John Island, and late in the afternoon, anchored in a little bay and uh, rode the boat ashore and climbed this hill to an old sugarcane plantation. Uh, and uh, I had a six pack of beer, or a couple of beers anyway. And sitting up there at the wall you mentioned was the ruins of the sugarcane plantation, covered with bougainvillea. It was beautiful, you know, it was just idyllic, looking at the sun setting out over, over Little Thatch Island. And it's, it's beautiful, idyllic. And then it occurred to me, that this wall I was sitting on, this whole plantation, had been built on the bones of thousands of slaves. And then it struck me the whole hemisphere is built on the bones of millions of slaves, indigenous people, Africans, so on. And then I had to admit that I was a slaver. I'd been enslaving people around the world in debt, different kind of slavery. Uh, some would argue not nearly as serious, some would argue more serious, because it impacts the whole world in such a strong way. But at that moment, I decided I would never do it again. And I went back a couple of days later and quit. It was my out. So it was that moment of enlightenment. There'd been a lot leading up to it, but right then there, sitting on that sugar cane plantation's walls, it hit. Yeah, thank you for that. I'm glad, I'm glad it hit and that you followed it, because a lot of people, I think, get that hit, but they don't necessarily follow through. They by the time they get back to the boat, they've already rationalized why it's better to stay where they are than to make the step you change. Because I think it took a lot of courage. You may not see that, but I think it took a lot of courage to, to quit. And I, as I recall, there was some threats to you about, you know, against your well-being, or let's say even your life, um, in, in doing that. So it was quite a, a real risk, too. It wasn't just a risk of losing one, one, ending one career and starting a new one. Yeah, um, so <clears throat> once I quit, I started to write a book. And I wanted to be an expose, so I contacted other people that had jobs like mine. And I didn't mention the jackals, but these are the people who, when we economic hitmen fail, if a president doesn't go along with the system, then people we call jackals go in and overthrow the government or assassinate the leader. And I write in the new Confessions of an Economic Hitman about how I... Uh, you know, two of my clients, democratically elected president of Ecuador, Jaime Roldos, head of state of Panama, Omar Torrijos, had tremendous integrity. They wouldn't, they wouldn't buy the system. And they were both assassinated by CIA assets. So I contacted some of those assets too, some of the jackals. And uh, immediately I got phone calls threatening my life and that of my young daughter. Um, and at the same time, I got taken out to dinner 
one night by the CEO, chairman of the board of uh, Stone and Webster, the competitor of my firm. My firm was Charles D. Main, my former firm. And he said, uh, you've got a great resume. Chief economist, I had 50 people working for me. He said, we'd like to use your resume in our proposals. You don't have to do any work at all for us. Just let us use your resume. And um, I'm prepared tomorrow to write you a check for half a million dollars. This is 1983 or 84, half a million dollars was worth more than today. <laughs> and he said, just don't write the book. So what would you do? <laughs> my daughter's life's being threatened. My life's being threatened. I'm being offered a bribe, totally legal bribe. It's completely legal to do that. Um, I took the money. And, you know, in, self in my own defense, I'd say I didn't go out and buy a mansion or a bunch of fast cars. I, I reinvented myself, kind of. I, I went back to places, the countries that I'd screwed uh, and uh, offered to help the people. Eventually formed Dream Change, as you mentioned, and then Pachamama Alliance came out of that and began writing books about indigenous people, which was okay with Stone Webster. Uh, shape shifting the world is as you dream at five books about that but I and working extensively with these people and trying to understand how we could turn the system around and started thinking about this and then on 9-11 I was in the Amazon but when I came home I went to the ground zero and as I stood there looking into that smoldering pit I decided I had to write the book but I decided this time I wouldn't write an expose I'd write a personal confession I wouldn't tell anybody that I was doing it. I'd write the whole manuscript. And once I got it in the hands of a very good New York agent and he starts sending out to publishers, I figured it was my insurance policy that any good jackal would know that killing me would send book sales skyrocketing. You know, they skyrocketed anyway. <laughs> it went to number one. It went on the New York Times bestseller list and stayed there for a year and a half. But if one of you guys shoots me tonight, <laughs> my my publisher over here. Well, I think it's too late for them to shoot you, John. Do, well, you know, and and I didn't ever talk about this um, in the first book because it hadn't happened. But in this in the new Confessions of an Economic Hitman, I I was I believe poisoned uh, about five months after the first Confessions came out. I was scheduled to speak at the United Nations on a Tuesday. Monday night, I flew from my home in Florida. I lived in Florida at the time, up to New York. And it was a very strange circumstance that there's been this freelance journalist who my publicist and I had been putting him off, putting him off. He just didn't seem to have very good credentials and we weren't going to interview, just wasn't interested. And But he offered to pick me up at LaGuardia Airport and drive me into town and take me to lunch and then to the person I was staying with, an old friend, and I thought, well, what the hell, that's better than a taxi. And uh, we, we did that, and I went to the restroom when the lunch was served, so anything could have happened. He asked some very stupid questions. He was not a good journalist. I, was, I got out of there pretty quickly. Uh, a couple hours later, I lost 70% <clears throat> of the blood in my body, in, internal bleeding, and was rushed to a hospital Spent two weeks in Lenox Hill Hospital in New York and ended up having 70% of my colon removed, my large intestine. And uh, you know, the doctor I had said, yes, it could easily, it could very well be poison, it could be, but it wouldn't be poison. I said it'd probably be ground glass, something like that that wouldn't show up in any, any tests. And that's, of course, the only way that a good assassin would work. So I, till this day, don't have any proof. But <laughs> I was always very suspicious. Uh, you know, that's the that's the way that they people die of cancer or heart attack or something. And anyway, I, I, I don't know. But um, it hasn't happened again since. I'm really careful of where I eat. I only eat here. <laughs> <laughs> Good plug for the battery. <laughs> John, John, I'd like you to talk about uh, not just dream changers, because that was one of the foundations you set up after this. But what has what fuels you now? What what makes your heart sing now in terms of work you're doing? Because I know you're speaking a lot, and if you're doing a book reading, especially if you have a new book out, people want to hear you know the dirt in the book. 
but I'm looking for where's what's the vision you have for how the world the theme of, of all of the Meet the Visionary series is what kind what do conscious leaders need to do in today's world? So I'd I'd like to to look at what what kind of consciousness or what kind of leadership we need to get where we can get and transcend all these dysfunctional systems that we have in place now. Not more, more than just dysfunctional, but actually in, in some cases doing the exact opposite of what they were intended to do. Yeah, well, the short version is, and, and incidentally, if any of you are interested in the longer version, in addition to buying the book, I'm speaking in Berkeley tomorrow night in, in Menlo Park, uh, Thursday night. You can go to my website, johnperkins.org. Um, it'll be very different from this. This is actually more fun, I think. You know, I don't have to just stand up there and talk. But anyway, um, the reason I wrote the new confessions is because things have gotten so much worse in the last 12 years. Uh, the economic hitman system that I described in the first book mainly took place in the developing world. And now it's spread to the United States, Europe, and the rest of the world. We've really seen the creation of a totally failed economic system worldwide that's it's only good for the very wealthy. Uh, it's a system that's based on debt, fear, and the destruction of the very resources upon which it depends. They call it a death economy because, in fact, it's killing itself. It's consuming itself into extinction, and we know that. We know we have to change. At the same time, during these 12 years, we've woken up. During these 12 years, I've spent probably 80% of it traveling around the world speaking at all kinds of venues. I, I spoke to a group of 4,000 CEOs at one time, and, and universities, and business schools, and green festivals, and rock festivals, just a tremendous variety of people. I feel very blessed to have this opportunity in, in China, throughout Asia, Middle East, former Soviet countries, Latin America, North America. And everywhere I go, I find that people are really waking up. There's a consciousness revolution. Waking up to the fact that we live on a very fragile space station without any shuttles. We can't get off. We don't want to get off. My eight-year-old grandson won't be able to get off. Maybe a few people will go to Mars <laughs> without a return ticket. That's an attractive sounding proposition, isn't it? Maybe some of you will go to the moon, but most of us won't. And we've got to take care of it. So there's these two things happening. It's gotten so much worse. And one of the reasons it's gotten worse, I think, is because the, 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 the status quo, the people who, who run the system, very small handful, you know, the people, the, what I call the corporatocracy, uh, are seeing that there's this consciousness revolution. And so they're setting in more. The jackals have gotten worse in the, in the United States, in Europe, and the economic hitmen. They're, they're they, they, we're, all, we're all hit frequently. So this is a time when we particularly need consciousness. It's happening, and we need to make it happen faster. Uh, you know, People are really waking up. But in addition to waking up, we also need to take action every day, every one of us. Uh, we, we, you know, this, during this presidential election, I think it's especially important to know that the President of the United States really doesn't really has very limited power. It's an important election symbolically, but to understand that, that our presidents really don't, they have very limited power. You used to think that the president, one of the, one of the powers the president had was this, uh, to appoint a Supreme Court justice. <laughs> we have to question that now. But to understand that um, whoever the president is, he or she will be surrounded by people that are basically economic hitmen, politicians who've accepted huge bribes, legal bribes from big corporations through campaign financing and through the offer of consulting jobs if they lose or if they decide not to run again. Uh, so even if we get a president who, even, let's say a Sanders, that never accepts a penny from the corporations and should get elected, he's going to still be surrounded by lobbyists and people who are totally in the pockets of uh, the big corporations. And incidentally, I'm to the big corporations, I think, are, are our hope also. I'm not trying to come down hard on them. We need to change them. We can talk about that in a minute. But so people are waking up. Uh, we need to wake up across the planet. We're waking up. The status quo is 
setting in and the, the, the whole, most of the book, the, the new book is about, about bats, what's happened in 12 years and the strategy we can employ to change it. That every one of us has a role to play in this. This is democracy. You have to do it. We have to do it. If you look at every revolution in history, it's been the people, and it usually starts with a pretty small handful of people, about 15% of some population that, that makes it happen. And we're, we're reaching that point now. It's, it's a really, really exciting time to be alive and to be a revolutionary. We're revolutionaries here, good revolutionaries. We don't need to take up guns. When you talk about the corporatocracy being a, a relatively small number of people, uh, I want to push back on you a little bit on that because there's so many people that are reinforcing the systems, even though they're critical of the systems, they are reinforcing it just by their everyday actions, probably somewhat oblivious to the fact that they're doing that. So they can complain about system A while they're in system A and working in system A and, and taking actions every day that reinforce and actually make system A even stronger as a dysfunctional system. I, I, a couple of years ago, I did an article about the number of lobbyists in Washington. And I think every, if you divide each politician in Washington by the number of lobbyists in Washington, it comes out to somewhere around three or 400 lobbyists per Congre or Congress or House, Congress or Senator. For each elected official, they've got 300 people, 400 people knocking on their door wanting something. Imagine if you had that many people outside your office, how much work you'd get done. I mean, other than trying, you know, visiting them and giving them, having, listening to them and talking about what they think is best for, for the country. Yeah, and I think that's deceptive too because officially there's slightly less than 13,000 lobbyists registered. But like you said, there's a lot more than that. And, and even that represents 23 for every member of Congress. But beyond that, we've got so many political consultants. And I think a great example, great's probably the wrong word here, is, is Senator Dodd, Democratic senator, who uh, was head of the, was, was chairman of the Senate uh, Banking Committee and ran for president. And also when he ran for Senate and when he ran for president, both times, he accepted huge amounts of money from the financial services organizations, the very organizations that he was watchdogging as chairman of the banking committee. And he swore he would never become a lobbyist. And now he's the chief lobbyist for the uh, movie industry. And uh, they single him out, but there's many Republicans, many Democrats. I mean, it's just, the list is almost endless of the people that do this. And they have tremendous power. And what do we expect of them when they're in Congress? You know, the other, the, and our bankers, the Wall Street moguls, these, this is the corporatocracy. And I want to make it clear that I'm not, I'm not talking about a conspiracy theory here. These people don't all get together and, and conspire to do something illegal. Most of them don't even know each other. But they're all driven by one motive. And it's a pretty new motive. It, 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 it's not what I was taught in business school. I was taught in business school in the late 60s that a good CEO, um, makes a decent rate of return for his investors. But beyond that, takes really good care of his employees. A good CEO takes a cut in salary before laying anybody off. Imagine that, Donald or Jack Welch or <laughs> any of these guys. A good CEO takes good care of his consumers, his clients, his suppliers, and his community. Pays taxes. Imagine that. <laughs> and. Um, Beyond that, gives money to the local school system and uh, recreational facilities. I was taught that in the late 60s. That all changed in uh, 1976, almost 200 years after the Revolutionary War supposedly freed us from the East India Company, which is what the Revolutionary War was really about. Um, in 1976, um, the Nobel Prize in, in economics was Looking out there, probably some of you weren't even, a lot of you weren't even alive then, but just take my word for it, the Nobel Prize in economics was won in 1976 by Milton Friedman, who, among other things, the most important thing probably he said is the only responsibility of business is to maximize profits, regardless of the social and environmental costs. Well, that changed everything. That was new, that was radical. And it's been bought into ever since. And it's created this system that's 
that's a, this death economy that's a failure. And there's so many statistics that would show this to be a failure. Things like, you know, seven out of 10 people today live in, in countries with more inequality than 30 years ago. And we've got two, two and a half billion people on this planet who are living at or below the poverty level of $2 a day, two and a half billion, that's the most ever. And another two billion or so that live just slightly above it. Uh, and a statistic I think is really important is that less than 5% of us live here in the United States and we consume almost 30% of the world's resources. Well, half the world's starving or on the verge of starvation. Now, I ask you, is that a model? 5% consuming 30%. Can China with 19% of the world's population emulate that? Obviously, they can't. They're trying, but they can't do it. Russia can't do it. Brazil can't do it. India can't do it. Nobody can do it. It's a failed system. And we need, that's that, that lower rung of that model that you showed. You know, we need to admit this. And now we need to see that we, we, we have the opportunity to create a life economy that's based on regenerating destroyed environments, cleaning up pollution, doing away with the causes of, of violence and terrorism. We can create a whole new economic model pretty easily, pretty quickly. I'm, I'm totally convinced of it. We just have to first admit that we've got a failed system and then move into the next stage. Consciousness. Yes, thank you. Um, I just went blank on the question I was going to ask. We're going to open it up to you guys pretty soon, but I wanted to ask you one more question, but I think it's left me. What does the life economy look like? You want to answer your own question? <laughs> sure. I love it, you know, like, because I'm so excited about this. You know, <laughs> it's very, by the way, it's very related because it's now come back to me is what do you see? as the way to getting to that better oh, that's future. That's it, yeah. Um, you know, we have two realities as human beings. We, uh, this is the objective reality, this microphone. But there's another reality that's much more important and probably we're the only, we, as far as you know, living creatures that are, that are actually controlled by what's, what they call the perceived reality, which is the words I'm speaking through this microphone. And the culture is perceived reality. Religions are perceived reality. Countries are perceived realities. Uh, then we codify borders or whatever into law and it impacts the objective reality. Uh, and I like, the, I like to think about how in 1773, the perceived reality was that the British were invincible. And then George Washington, who had fought in the French and Indian War 12 years earlier, just like my book, 12 years, it's an important time there. <laughs> Uh, said, no, they're not. You know, like I saw General Braddock defeated at the Battle of the Monongahela, 12, 1,400 British soldiers defeated by 300 French and Indians. Uh, 1,000 British were killed or severely wounded, less than 100 British, uh, French and Indians. He said, all we got to do is hide behind trees. <laughs> and they're lined up out there with all these bright red coats on. <laughs> we just stand behind trees and shoot them. And then Tom Paine and Thomas Jefferson inspired people with language around all of that. And within less than a year, the perceived reality changed. The idea that maximizing profits is the goal of business is a perceived reality. And all we got to do is convince all the businesses we buy from, we work for, we're forming some of you with startups and so on, that the true reality, the new perceived reality is that Businesses should pay a good rate of return to investors. We need investors to move into a life economy. We need to create new forms of transportation, communications, energy. We need to learn how to uh, clean up the oceans and so on and so forth. Um, so pay a decent rate of return. But beyond that, serve a public interest. Serve us, the people. And we have 100 years of history, actually, in the United States. We could talk about that if we have time. but. Um, where that was the only thing that was required of a corporation to be to get a charter was to prove that it was going to serve a public interest. So to serve a public interest, to serve us and future generations. And I think, you know, when we, when we start to change that mindset, things can happen very quickly. So just imagine, imagine that the companies that today are building weapons to kill people um, are instead using our tax dollars to come up with systems for mining 
the plastic that's floating around in the ocean and digging up all the oil that Texaco spilled in the, in the Ecuadorian Amazon and everywhere else where all the oil spilled and totally recycling. And imagine if we paid the big agribusinesses to instead of destroying the land with chemicals to really come up with organic ways for starving people to grow food more efficiently and, and store it and distribute it and coming up with whole new technologies. I mean, we talk about solar and wind and that's made huge inroads. I mean, it's just amazing how we've changed things, but we haven't even imagined how other ways to form, to make energy. I mean, there's things waiting to be imagined out there in energy, transportation, communication. I mean, this is exciting. There's a really exciting economy waiting for us. And all it takes is a change of that perceived reality. Just a, just a little tinkering here. One of the perceived realities now, the existing perceived realities, is what can I do? I'm only one person. Some people identify with that, perhaps. So I'd like to open it up to questions from you with the idea of not getting into facts about ain't it awful and the and the hitman story and all that but what what is what kind of question can you ask or comment can you make that would give hope to others in the room so that you leave here somewhat inspired to do something different than what you've been doing something different in way of doing something more uh, sustaining the life economy rather than continuing to contribute to the death economy is that beautiful yeah great so let's open it up uh, who's got the microphone tom okay hi thanks for speaking with us today um i think one of the ideas that goes along with maximizing shareholder profit is the idea of sort of shareholder democracy right and so you have these activist investors who are driving um high returns and so how do you sort of how do you balance that where um, people who own shares in companies should have a voice in those companies great great question um, I, I think it's it's a, a change of minds that we ask people why do you want to have a high return on your investment that's an essential question and I think for most people it's to it's to provide a secure future for oneself and perhaps one's children um, and there may be another group of people out there that it's, it's just this mindset that we measure ourselves by money. It, it strikes me that athletes these days aren't, aren't measured so much by whether they win a game or not, but by how much money they make in the next contract, which usually is based on winning games. But this measure that we have, and so we change that. Uh, you know, imagine if, if in, on the Forbes magazine put on its cover instead of the wealthiest people, the ones that are doing the most to create a better future for our children. And so if we can really look at creating a new system, a life economy that's going to guarantee, I'm not talking about socialism here, I'm, t I'm talking about a, a, a new way of looking, we, might we can call it whatever we want actually, whatever the term is, but to guarantee that all of us and our, and our children will have a good house, good medical care, uh, we can certainly do that. There's, there's no reason not to do that. And then you, you, you lose the, one of the incentives, at least, to uh, feel that you've got to constantly go out there and make more money off your investments or your business or whatever. If you understand that for, your, for our future generations on this planet uh, to live a, a fulfilling life, uh, an environmentally sustainable uh, life, socially just life, then... Um, We've got to create new systems that make that happen, and wealth isn't going to make that happen. If this spaceship crashes, those 62 people that have as much wealth as half the world's population will crash too. And they need to understand that. We all need to understand that. So, so it's, it's changing this perceived reality that money doesn't buy it for us. The wealthiest country in the history of the world, the United States, and yet we have some of the highest rates of negativity, drug, drug abuse, spousal abuse, child abuse, incarceration. You know, we're not a happy country. And if you take, if you look at it from another standpoint, uh, the wealthiest continent on the planet is what? Africa. That's the poorest country per capita for the people who live there. So this isn't a function of, you know, I, and I can speak, I was making good money as an economic hitman and not happy. 
And I think a lot of us are stuck in that. So it's, it's a change of mindset. Thanks. Hi, John. Um, so I just wanted to say, can you say your all, name before you speak? And right. speak. So, sorry, thanks. <laughs> My name is David Adama. Um, Hi, David. So I served twice in Peace Corps, and part of my decision-making process when I got my first job offer from a governor in the Philippines after Peace Corps was informed by reading your book. And after doing some research, I found out that his family controlled all but one office in their province, and the guy had been known to kill people that were in his way. So I just thought it would be nice for you to know that your work has changed things, even though people might say, you know, you took the money. Um, it did help inform other people's decision making for the right. And, um, you know, thank you. No job I've taken since has paid enough for me to save money. But, uh, <laughs> you know, they're all jobs that have made me feel good at the end of the day. But I constantly come up with, you know, concern I'll never have enough money to retire because I'm trying to do the right thing. But, um, it's hard to see the greed out there. And why can't they get mine? Everyone else is getting theirs, you know, and that's, that's a challenge over time to deal with. So I'm just curious what your thoughts are on greed and how that can change in a society that largely thrives on greed. Thanks, and uh, that was nice, very nice to hear your story. I, I, I hear fairly frequently from people how the books have impacted them. And I, I have to say I'm pretty humble about it because I know as a writer that we write something, we write a story, and the best thing a writer can do is write a story that everybody's going to interpret according to themselves. And that's really nice to hear that you interpreted it that way. Thank you. Um, you know, yeah, the system is, is right now this, this death economy is driven by uh, greed, fear, debt, uh, and the destruction of resources, and it's not working. And we all know that greed does not make us happy. It's 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 a lousy system. Um, so we need to really change that mindset and not and not have that that idea in our mind that we've got to keep accumulating and accumulating. The life you're leading, uh, you're worried about retirement, perhaps. But I I'm. It's been really been my experience that if you really follow your heart. We follow our passion. The universe delivers, uh, and you'll, you'll you'll be okay. Uh, and but even more important, what I would suggest is devote yourself to creating this new system that's going to make sure that you're going to be okay, and that all of our children are okay. You know, and I think I have an eight-year-old grandson, and what I have to realize is that for the first time in human history, the only way Grant, my grandson, is going to inherit a good world is if every child on the planet inherits a good world. And that was never true before. We only had to look out for California, or the state of Washington, or I live, or the United States. Now we, have, we, we understand that it's, that it's the whole planet, and that uh, we must take care of the space station that we're on. And I'm sure the Peace Corps gave you great insights into that. So thanks for sharing that. I'd like to add <clears throat> that there are plenty of investment vehicles uh, in place now, and it's growing, where people are investing for return, but also because they feel good about what they're investing in. They're investing in a cause of some sort. So they are getting a value beyond just the dollar return. They're also getting a feel-good return. And they feel like they're doing the right thing by doing that, and not necessarily getting a low return, but not getting as high as they might in some other thing that was more exploitive. Uh, where's the microphone now? Hi, my name is uh, Keith, and you'd mentioned kind of changing the perceived mindset. And, you know, you had Washington in the Revolutionary War and Milton Friedman in 1976. Do you see anything now, or do you have an idea of what event that might be? Or, like, I mean, how would we recognize it if it occurred? Thank you. Um, and And I think... If we look at history, we've gone through so many times of when we've been faced by terrible crises. Uh, my great-grandmother thought the Civil War was going to destroy this country. My grandmother thought World War I was going to destroy this country, and then the Depression. My parents thought that World War II was going to destroy the country, and then there was Stalinism, and so on and so forth. 
and we come through these times. And we also know that we've had a huge impact. When I was in college, there was apartheid in South Africa. We convinced corporations that supported it not to support it anymore, and it went away. Um, there was uh, the rivers, the Charles River. I went to business school in Boston. Was so fetid, so foul that you couldn't walk beside it. There were rivers in Ohio that were on fire with pollution. The Hudson was awfully polluted by General Electric. But, but you know, Jack Welch he did a good job with that, uh, and uh, it's got cleaned up. And we get those rivers cleaned up. We get our doors open much wider to minorities and women and corporations and elsewhere. There's still a lot to be done. But and we look at the changes in gender issues in just the last five years, ten years, five years. Incredible things have happened. The the growth in solar and wind, uh, renewable energy has just taken off. And meanwhile, we've shut down the development of any new coal plants, essentially, in this country. There's huge successes, and it's usually a very small number of people that make these things happen. So uh, I, what I would suggest is that, you know, that, that to me, the, the key to changing this are the corporations. They have the power, and they're just figments of our imagination. They're just perceived realities, and we can turn them around. I know so many top executives. I recently spoke, as I mentioned earlier, at a conference of 4,000 CEOs, and I spent a week afterwards with them. I did the opening speech, and then I just hung out. And you know, time after time after time, I heard from these people, uh, men and women, that they want to be greener. They want their companies to do a better job. But they're afraid that if they lose half a percentage of market share, they'll lose their jobs. And so they said, you know what? They asked me, when you go out there speaking to people, and I'll, I'll do this right now, ask those people to form uh, online consumer movements. And so if each one of you will pick a corporation that you love <laughs> but that, or that you have some problem with, Chevron, uh, Monsanto, Walmart, Nike, I don't care, pick one. And then write a, a short post an email, a, twi a, tw a twi tweet them, <laughs> a Twitter, <laughs> uh, that says something like, I love your products. Like, don't make them the enemy. I love your products, but I'm not going to buy them anymore until you clean up the mess of oil you've created in the Amazon, or you pay your workers a fair wage, or whatever your gripe is. And don't just send it to the company. Send it to all your friends on all your social media and ask them to send it to the company. And the, the CEOs are looking for this. Uh, they tell me, you know, I want to have that kind of information that I can take to my executive board, the people who can, who can fire me if I lose half a percentage of market share, and I'm going to tell them, look, these are our customers. And yes, maybe we'll lose half a percent of market share for the next quarter, but this is a long-term strategy for keeping these people and for getting more people. So do that, all of you. If every day you take a stand in this direction, it doesn't take a lot of work to do that. We'll bring these things, we'll bring this around. We'll bring it around quickly. These corporations want to do the right thing. You know, the executives, I don't know any sociopaths running corporations. I know statistically there are quite a few out there. But even they will be brought around by this because sociopaths are not about making money. They're about being successful. However, we define success. So if we define success of turning their companies around this way, they'll do that. It's up to us. Sociopaths are also into looking good. So if you can right. help them look good by doing the right thing, that you're helping Exactly. Them. One of the things I wanted to mention is that sometimes we forget that these systems that we're complaining about, these systems that are so dysfunctional and so harmful, we created them. So if people can create them, people can change them. It is within the realm of possibility. It is not an impossible task. Let's see if there's anybody who's actually doing something different that you could use to inspire others. Do we do we have anybody? that? Okay. Do we have anybody? So I wrote a book called It's a Shareable Life, which is a practical guide to the sharing economy. But what I've recently been really into is this idea of platform cooperativism, which is a way to distribute value across organizations from the value creators themselves. So it's taking the cooperative model and applying it to the digital environment. Beautiful. Thank and what's you. What's your name? Chelsea Rostrum. Thank you. And where can people get your book? Uh, shareablelife.com.
Great, thank you. Yeah, co-ops, B corporations, my publisher, incidentally, when you buy one of these books over here, you're contributing to a certified be benefit corporation. Okay. Sorry, right. My name's Jason. In this course with a uh, bunch of my friends I have, come across a very specific worldview, which is that inequality is inherent in the world. That the best way to actually move the world forward is to concentrate resources at the cutting edge and have innovation come down and bring the world forward. How would you address that worldview and what particular things would you point out that may be fallacies if there are any in that? I'm not sure I understand the worldview. Would you, can you say that again? It, it, that inequality is what? It's inherent in the world and that the best you, way to actually bring things forward is to innovate and have those, it's essentially a variation on Reaganomics, have innovation trickle down, but concentrate resources so we can actually have those breakthroughs. Concentrate resources in what way? Into the cutting edge, the what front does that of the mean? world. What does that mean? In this case, I guess I would say America and uh, the developed world. But well, I, I think it's absolute BS. It's it's a I mean, good God, what is you know that's you know trickle down economics doesn't work. We know that that's been, that's been proven beyond any shadow of a doubt. And every major economist from J Joe Stiglitz who. You know, as chief economist of the World Bank and won the Nobel Prize in economics, the Klugman also won, see this very clearly. And these austerity programs don't don't work. We have to get things out to the people. I do not believe that inequality is inherent. That's to me, that's that's a abhorrent idea. I spend a lot of time with indigenous people, and their whole thing is community. They believe that everyone is totally equal. And everybody deserves to have good, have sufficient food and, and clothing, and and housing and love. And if anybody doesn't have any one of those things, then the whole community suffers. And they need to take care of it. So there may be inequality in terms of, uh, you know, uh, you may be a much better tennis player than me. Chances are very good that you are. <laughs> Maybe I'm a better writer than you. I don't know. But is that inequality? I don't know. But we, we do have differences. There's no question we have differences. But I'm, I believe in democracy totally. I believe in, in, in the right of all of us to pursue you know, our, best, our, our best talents and to use our passions to move forward with our passions. So I want to see a system where every one of you can go into your passions. And I think that's how this is going to happen. I so often think of Again, the American Revolution, I love it. I come from over 300 years of Yankees in New Hampshire and Vermont, New England. My, my, my ancestors fought in the American Revolution and the French and Indian War. And uh, I've often thought how fortunate we are that uh, Tom Paine did not try to lead armies. And George Washington did not try to write pamphlets. <laughs> You know, Paine had a passion and talent for writing pamphlets, and Washington had a passion and talent for leading armies. Martha Washington had a passion and talent for organizing women to make clothes for the men at the forefront. They all took a different path, but they were headed for the same destination of getting out from under the tyranny of the East India Company. We might say the British rule, but it was really the East India Company, which ruled Britain. Uh, today, we all can use our different passions and talents and go separate paths, but let's all head for the same destination of getting out from under the tyranny of a death economy and create a life economy. And that's going to take all of us doing it, and I believe that we're all, we are, we are all, we're all equal. We all have different talents and different passions, but there's an equality there. Thanks. I, uh, this, this, so I'm, I'm uh, David's brother, Eric Adama, and I come at this from a little different perspective. In, in the past, when your book came out, I was dating someone who had had been in the Peace Corps, insisted I read your book, and my brother obviously has. And he was know, in the Peace Corps, right? She was in the Peace Corps. David was in the Peace Corps, and that. Well, that what you, happened? What happened to you? <laughs> well, this is why I'm stepping up, and just to give you a little different perspective, because you know you resonate with those people, right? You, this sort of radical language and, and vernacular that comes with it, and I think here you probably have more of a mainstream audience in Berkeley and Menlo Park. And it's interesting that you bring up Thomas Paine and George Washington. I think the challenge to make this a reality is to coalesce it into a into a vernacular, into a into an action plan, into a game plan that 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 resonates with corporations that you've spent so much time focusing on. And so I guess my question to you is, at what point do you do you change the dialogue from talking about how everyone, you know, people are in Washington are corrupt, and even Bernie Sanders has got these people around him, and we're on a 
a spaceship and, and to a more mainstream language that the average person in the audience can can get behind and resonate with and bring up within you know leading from below in their own corporations to help foster the change i think that's really the challenge is, is making that shift and i'd be curious to hear what you think of that because the well, beginning of your talk was very radical types of words from someone and, and you know on the side I, I work for an investment firm but I, on the side i'm on boards of two different nonprofits that are focused on environmental protection and land trusts so those people are very cognizant of what needs to be done and making change happen, but it's got to be done in a way that resonates with the public. Well, if if I come across as sounding radical here, then I've obviously failed because I was I'm not I don't consider myself a radical at all. I do a lot of work with big corporations and and work with their CEOs. And what I'm trying to reflect here is one of the things that they've asked of me is to to encourage people to come back to them and say, change, to, send, to overload them with, with emails, because most of them want to change. They realize that this system isn't working. When I get invited to speak at a, at, a, at a business school or at a big corporate conference, one of the first things I do is ask the organizers, why me? And they'll say, because our people are smart, and they know the system is not working, and they want to know how to, how to change it. So I, I don't know what I've said that you consider radical. What, what would you? Well, I mean, listen, you're, you're a highly educated person. You're a man of the world. I, I, I mean, I just think, as a show of hands, how many people in here think that if it was presented in different words, it would be easier for someone who worked for a corporation to embrace and bring up? I, I would, I mean, I'll just, I'll hand off the mic, but I would just say that um, I, I think it, it's, it, unless you well, I'd, like, I'd like to go into that. I'd, like to, I'd actually like to see a show of hands. How many of you think I've been speaking radically and opposing corporations here? Two, one, two, did I see it? I see a hand here. It was a one, one here, one, two. So not very many, but, but even if this well, is a couple it's of obviously, mentions, you know, She's with a all radical respect. hippie. John, I... Preachy, okay. No, I, this is important. This is with good all due respect, I mean, it's no, a self-selected is... crowd, right? I mean, the, the other night, Lance Armstrong was here. There were a bunch of Lance Armstrong supporters. It's probably not representative of the demographic. <laughs> right. I, I'm here because I, I believe in, in the cause, but I'm just saying that to, to have it spread, it needs to change. The dialogue needs to change. So, so, let, so let me tell you what I say when I'm speaking to big corporations. So the last two big summits I spoke to of corporations, one was about 4,000 CEOs of, t t of uh, communications companies. And uh, this, this conference was in Istanbul. The majority of them came from former Soviet countries, from the Middle East, and from Europe, and then there are quite a few from the United States. And one of the, you know, so I, we talked about the history. I talked about how things are failing because that's what they wanted me there for. They said that they knew this. And then I said to them, you know, so what is it that you want to communicate uh, to future generations? What do you want your grandchildren? And your children and grandchildren to remember you for a CEO or CFO or whatever of a communications company. Do you want to continue talking about the sex lives of, of uh, star, star actors and actresses and sports and so on? Or do you want to really talk about something that will make a better world for your children? That's the challenge here. What is it that you want to accomplish? And how do you go about making that happen? Um, how do we, how, to recognize that we're in a, we're in a situation that is it that is failing? And they all recognize that. I mean, you have to be pretty stupid to think that the melting glaciers and rising oceans uh, and climate change are, are something to be proud of. Or, or to think that, that we haven't had any influence on that, that our industries haven't. Yes, climate may be naturally changing too, but certainly all this stuff we're pumping into the oceans and the atmosphere has to have an impact. You know, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, it, yeah. it, it, the dialogue has changed on that too, right? I mean, right. It, climate change is accepted, whereas it wasn't ten years ago. Right. Um, and, and, all and, I'm and, saying, John, and, I, and, I have a lot of respect for your life's work, and I think to, yeah, I'm not trying. Just to... in terms of creating an action plan, your idea of going to a website and and adding to the blog, I won't buy your products until this changes, is is good. It's something that everyone here can step up and do. And I just think for the, but if you want to, if you need, if you need to get to that fifteen percent to spread that, it's just the words that are used. And, and I'm not trying to be overly critical, I'm just an observer. Um, you were saying uh, examples of how this, we might create a life economy. So uh, my name is Mark Barish, and uh, 
10 years ago, I wrote a book called uh, Field Notes and the Compassionate Life. It was made into a, a, a film called I Am, and it was media stuff. And I decided I didn't want to just do media stuff anymore. I wanted to practice compassion in the world. So I stopped what I was doing, uh, a long career, and just asked that question. Uh, you know, what if I set that as the, the goal of my life, and that would be it. And uh, through synchronicities and effort, um, wound up starting a foundation that's planted trees in three continents, uh, six countries around the world. But that led in turn to uh, a company that is uh, in working, starting to work in Nigeria now to create what could become a billion dollar uh, regenerative industry based on a tree that has uh, super nutritious leaves and regenerates land and uh, alleviates poverty. And I'm not making a pitch for my effort. I'm just saying that I think anybody can actually if they set that goal, you talked about consciousness and the role of consciousness. And if we said, let's, let's not just reform the existing corporations and hijack that DNA, let's create a new DNA. Let's look at what a regenerative uh, business would really look like, not just sustainable, but regenerative. And uh, I personally have found that uh, it's possible to do that. And I've found that people like the ex-head uh, of operations for Kraft Foods have shown up and are partners of mine in this project. And there are a lot of people around looking for compassionate, conscious industry to uh, really uh, do something de novo, not just uh, nibble around the edges of what we have now. And I think I just uh, personally convinced that's entirely possible with consciousness and compassion. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Mohammed Hassan. Uh, so my question is, um, so the current debt economy has money at its center. And the advantage of that is that it focuses everyone on that singular metric. And the life economy, as I've heard it, and as, as you've explained it, has multiple objectives. I'm just wondering, how do you imagine the world moving forward without a similar unit or metric or single objective that we can optimize and, and try and, and just maximize? It's an essential question. And it's something that we need to work out more. And I think that would be a great thing for your passions to be focused on. I really encourage you to do it. I don't have a simple answer to that. But I would say that um, when Milton Friedman won the Nobel Prize in economics in um, 1976, he was coming at a time when capital was short and we considered that natural resources were abundant. We also considered that the world could absorb all the trash we threw at it. The oceans, the air, everything was basically able to take everything. We, we believe that. There was no, back in 76, nobody was talking about peak oil. Nobody was talking about carbon dioxide in the atmosphere or climate change. Those things just weren't even considered in, in, those, in those days. We weren't talking about sustainability. Um, and so Milton Friedman's theory was probably a very good one at the time. But things have changed radically now in just the short period of time. And we no longer actually have a shortage of capital, but we do have a shortage of resources. And we do have a shortage of the Earth's ability, we know, to absorb the trash that we've been throwing at it. And so we're coming in a very, very, very different place. So we must come up with different metrics for, for measuring this. And, and I think that's a, that's a fairly complex subject there. Uh, and I really encourage you to work on it. But the first step we need to take is, is, to, uh, is to actually make this commitment that we're going to create a new kind of economy, one that's not based on tearing up the resources, that destroying, you know, we, we're consuming ourselves into extinction, essentially, our, our businesses are, and, and that's not smart. So we have to make the commitment that we're no longer going to do that, and that we're going to encourage all of our companies to understand that we don't want them to do that anymore. We're not going to, and, and when, you know, we're going to encourage them to do something different and then come up with new metric uh, systems, more, more, new ways to measure that. And it is, a challenge. it is a challenge, but I think it's a very surmountable one. I think it's a detail. The first step is that change of, of consciousness, of perceived reality. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, John. This is great. Uh, nine years ago, I signed your book for my uh, book club, and so it's fun to have you at close range. Uh, my name is Ali Benazir, and I write about wellness, happiness, and uh, healthy relationships. And I was wondering, you've spent all this time with these indigenous cultures, and you've seen how they live their lives and how they achieve things like happiness and wellness. Are there some uh, portable practices from their lives that we can bring to 
our lives here in urban environments that are perhaps more disconnected. You know, people live in little cubby holes and don't see each other as often, not as much community, families get separated. Um, what, do you, what did you see that they did, some practice that we could apply to our own lives here? Thanks, um, and I certainly don't want to idealize indigenous cultures. They have their problems too, no question about it. But I think the most important takeaway from them is the re realization that, that, their, that their territory is uh, limited and they need to take care of it. And they're very good at that, to make sure that they pass on to their children and their grandchildren something as good as they inherited or even better. And I think that's something that we've forgotten in this business of ravaging our, the resources. We're not really looking after our, our future generations. And the other thing is that indigenous cultures that I've worked with really understand the need to take care of everyone. That if anyone is self-suffering, then everyone suffers. And I, I think that's relevant today, too, in this time when we're all concerned about uh, terrorism. I'd just like to suggest that there is no such thing as global terrorism. An ism is something that reflects a common set of principles. Catholicism, capitalism, socialism. There are global acts of terror. But I've interviewed members of FARC in Colombia, Somali pirates, I've interviewed members of Al-Qaeda. They have no common principles. The only thing common to all of them is desperation. A sense of hopelessness that, that gets raised, the, the hopes get raised by a fanatic. That's sad. Uh, and the fanatic may be very wealthy, may not be hopeless, like Osama bin Laden. But people buy into that because they're desperate for the most part. But it, so it's, 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 this is not a globalism. <laughs> You know, and, and I think that's, a, that's another Im important recognition of the, of the world that we live in today. We need, to, we need to understand that and understand that human beings want to be, want to know that they're going to, when they get old and can't support themselves anymore, somebody's going to make sure they have a home and food and, and love. And indigenous communities are traditionally extremely good at that and extremely good at taking care of their uh, making sure their territory survives and their resource base survives. Those are both really important lessons for us, I think. Uh, my name is Nancy Reyes Mullins. I, um, I was telling my husband about your book because I read it about eight years ago and I was like, we have to go to this event tonight. And we had just finished watching House of Cards. And I was like, uh, I really had expected by now to the, the book to be a movie. Um, I really enjoyed it, and I think the more distribution and the more people read it, whether they agree with all of it, some of it, none of it, it's a great issue and story to share. Um, quickly, optimistically, I do think that people are identifying new and different ways of measuring non-financial metrics, back to the point the gentleman made about dollars and everything's measured in dollars. Um, the sustainable investing industry, which I'm involved in, now uses uh, what are called non-financial, but environmental, social, and governance metrics that corporations are starting to have to report on. And Morningstar, which I have no affiliation with, but I was very happy to hear that about two weeks ago, um, they're going to start ranking all investment uh, strategies, mutual funds, ETFs, et cetera, on a ESG, environmental, social, governance ranking as well. So everyone will have access to see how their investment strategies rank along that. And I think that kind of transparency is really great and optimistic and helps us kind of have a dialogue about investing in a different way. Um, my question to you is being involved in that space, it can be very difficult when policy works against you. And one of the issues that we've had is with Citizens United and corporations having that kind of power and having that kind of black box to put money into, but still kind of turn the wheel um, makes it very difficult. So how do you think, I guess, what policy we're in going into an election year, um, what kind of policies can we either overturn like Citizens United or where is there hopefulness on the policy side? Thanks Thank so you. much, and thanks for bringing up the investment uh, opportunities, the, the, the green investment. Thank you. I really appreciate that. And that, and that is so important that we move into that, that metric. Um, so 
so the, I, I think Citizens United, we need to overturn. I mean, there's just no question. That's that's a terrible policy. Uh, and one of the things with uh, Pachamama Alliance, how many of you know of Pachamama Alliance here? Oh, good. It's a great organization. If you don't, go to Pachamama.org. It's our headquarters are here in San Francisco. Uh, and we're in 85, 83 countries now with a, something called the Awakening the Dreamer program, which is about changing consciousness. And you're very familiar with it, John. You've been a supporter for a long time. Um, and uh, so one of the big programs that we're – two big drives that we're working on now, in addition to working a lot to say to help the Amazon, we also work – to in the United States to, to overturn Citizens United, the movement to amend, and, and also the climate change movement. I think those are two very, very essential uh, aspects of what we do. We've got to get money out of politics. I mean, let's face it, this is not, that's not democracy. You know, one person, one vote has been overruled by the, 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 by the money that's put into these things. But I think beyond that, for all of us to recognize that um, we have to do a lot more than just vote. You know, it isn't just about who gets elected. I, and the marketplace is a democracy. Corporations look at everything they're trading out there as, part, as, as ballots in a way. Every time you buy something or choose not to, you're casting a ballot. But it's also important to let the corporations know. So if you decide you're not going to buy a pair of shoes because they might have been made by people in sweatshops, let that company know, I didn't buy your shoes. And, and have all your friends send, send emails out to let them know, we, we want you to do better. We're with you. I'm totally with the corporations. I'm a capitalist by 100%. But we need to let them know. We need to give them the ammunition so that they feel that they can change without losing market share, without losing their jobs. And I would suggest that in this election year, that make a commitment right now that well, to first of all, take a look at why would you vote for the candidate you're thinking about voting for? What's, what's driving you to that vote? And make a commitment that no matter who wins, you will see to it that that issue is resolved the way you want it resolved. That if your candidate wins, you'll push like hell to make sure that that candidate has the support he or she needs to drive that through. If your candidate doesn't win, you'll still go after that policy. And social media is so powerful these days. You know, we don't have to go out in the streets and march and get arrested. We can still do that if we want. Uh, we don't have to carry a gun for this revolution. All we got to do is send emails <laughs> and other social networking. We can do amazing things that way. So please, if every one of us makes a commitment that, you know, it isn't so much about who wins. The issues that are being raised are important ones. The next president is symbolically important, but we, the people, can do so much. So please make a commitment to do that. Follow your heart. Follow your passions. I'd like to leave you with one last thought, if I could. If I could, um, and this is some, it's a two hundred year, more than two hundred year old thought. In fact, it was written the same year, two hundred years exactly, almost to the day before. Milton Friedman won the Nobel Prize in Economics. 1776, beginning of the American Revolution. Tom Paine, December 1776, wrote, these are the times that try men's souls. If there must be trouble, let it be in my day that my children, that my child may have peace. And so I say to you, I think there's a great commitment to make. If there must be trouble, let it be in our day that our children may have peace. And I look forward to taking care of that trouble with you guys and getting it over with before, our, before my grandson, who's eight years old, reaches my age in about 10 years. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'd like to thank you all for coming tonight. Um, once again, we'll, we'll be back with some other speakers later this year. And for any of you who are interested in the series, Meet the Visionaries, you can find out more at futureshapers.com. We would love to have you uh, attend future events, and they're monthly. Mm -hmm.